You remember not too long ago, we went to a watching in Mathura, and with the help of the truly knowledgeable tour guides, we learned quite a lot about those magnificent leather bags. Well, we thought the guides did such a good job that we wanted to find out more about the organization. And luckily for us, we caught up with Dennis Sami, the PRO of the group called Nature Seekers Incorporated of Matura. Um, Nature Seekers was formed in 1990, and um, this was a result of the wildlife section coming to the community of Matura and um, actually trying to find a solution to the senseless slaughtering that, um, that was occurring on this beach during the, during the 1980s. And um, when they came to Matura um, in 1990, um, Nature Seekers was a result of that um, collaborative effort between the wildlife section and the, the villagers. Ah. A classic example of how ordinary people do extraordinary work. Thanks to the enthusiasm and hard work of the people of Matura and the folks at the Wildlife Division, the turtles now have a safe nesting ground. Specifically, we were formed to, to, to curb the slaughtering of the, the turtles on this beach. One of the reasons which we do it is that before the season, we, we have an, uh, an annual cleanup campaign, a beach cleanup. And this is in, in order for the turtles to, to be free from any um, uh, um, debris that they may encounter while coming up on the beach during the nesting season. All right? And this is, uh, this is the first step of the season for the year. We happened to be at Matura in February when the nature seekers were cleaning up. But what exactly were they doing? We are moving the larger um, pieces of wood. We have long logs and so on. This arm hindered the turtles from coming in. So we moved them because if a turtle is coming in, she will turn and go back if collided with these logs. So we usually move them away. And then we have the lo lots of seaweeds. These cover the nests. So it's when time for hatchling is difficult for the hatchlings to get out. We have lots of plastic bags, um, big pieces of plastic, pieces of drift nets, large pieces. We also have large containers. We have, we even got today um, two big pieces like these big um, water tanks. We got like those um, milk tins, oil containers, a lot of garbage and what come in like what is dumped in rivers because we have lots of large rivers on the beach area. So you find um, they come down in the rainy season and are collected on the beach. So each year for the nesting season, we have to move them out and put them in garbage bags and take them to the road. But I discovered there's more to these nature seekers than just cleaning up. During the season, what we normally do is, uh, um, firstly, uh, we patrol. We patrol the beach um, on a nightly basis for the whole season. And um, this is very, very effective in actually keeping the poachers away. Uh, another thing is that um, we collect data. And this is very, very important in determining certain things about um, the ecology of the beach and about turtles. Um, data such as the length and width of the turtle, the condition of the turtle, the condition of the nest and site in which the turtle nested, um, the tide, the moon phase, you know, whether the, the, um, um, the, the area is higher up the watermark or closer to the watermark because uh, um, turtle they see like an area um, basically on the temperature all right it has a lot to do with temperature and um, uh, these are the information where data collection is concerned and um, in the near future we'll be able to determine a lot of things with this data and um, this information can be made available to the public all right in a more um, uh, logical way
so that we can explain some of the things that actually happen, right? Some of the things that we don't know right now. Dennis also has some advice for you folks who are going to watching for the first time. A fascinating and moving experience. I would recommend that people walk with water because, I mean, we are three miles from the village and we are we are not um, af um, fortunate to have a water supply in here. Okay, um, uh, walking with uh, some form of protection from the rain, like a raincoat, some a plastic, an umbrella, or something, you know, just to protect themselves. Um, walking with some food, you know, a change of clothing just in case people may get wet, you know, that sort of thing. Um, well, of course, uh, torchlight is very, very important because you're coming out in the night. But um, as I just indicated, that um, you know, you need um, you need not bring a torchlight down the beach because the guys will facilitate this um, this convenience. Remember, the tour guides are there to help you make the most of your turtle watching experience. But you must cooperate with them and respect the rules laid out by the wildlife division. Lately. People have been going to mature in droves. A sign of heightened interest in the turtles? It could appear not. Some of you have turned this precious opportunity to witness one of the many wonders of Mother Nature into a big line, a literal beach party. You've ignored these warning signs and the tour guides and persisted in touching the turtles at crucial moments. You have even attempted to ride on a pregnant turtle's back. How would you feel if someone did the same to you? Remember the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Applies not only to humans. The leatherback are an endangered species. If they can't reproduce in peace, Yet another link in the chain of life will be irretrievably broken. Extinction is forever, you know. Remember when you were in primary school and how you couldn't wait for the bell to ring for recess? The only thing in your mind then was getting to the lady who sold the snacks in the schoolyard. What was her name again? We used to call her Miss Lady. And the snacks were all homemade, except for the bottles on her tray or table which contained an assortment of sweets. Names like Kaza Ball and Paradise Plums come to mind. Throw your mind back to the tambran balls, not the tambran seeds you're getting nowadays. You know, sugar cakes, tulum, kurma, and char, pallori with chutney, chana, and red mango. And how many of you remember ice blocks? You only got those if the lady lived near to the school, because these had to be refrigerated. Mmm, those were either milky or fruit flavored. And how about curry mango? Remember how you would lick your fingers afterwards to make sure you got every cent worth of it? Whatever happened to those snacks? And I often wonder, what do school children feast on at recess time nowadays? Well, in most cases, that particular lady is no longer there. And many of these old-time snacks are now being replaced by commercially produced ones. You know, the corn curls and other kinds of salty tidbits packaged in brightly colored plastics and biscuits of every shape, size, and color. Now, you can call me old-fashioned if you like, but the paper packs held a special appeal for me. Chana sealed in a plastic bag, somehow that could never taste the same. And how many of you remember Chili Bibi? Remember how it always left you thirsty? <laughs> or the jokes about the sugar cakes and how the old lady chewed the coconuts to make them? But enough of me and my reminiscing. I suppose that's the price of progress. But I must remind you that these long-time snacks are very important if we are to preserve our cultural traditions. These snacks reveal so much of our past and of our development as a people. 
of how our ancestors made themselves at home in a strange and distant land. I'm sure you must have wondered at the origin of some of these, like Bara, Kurma, and Palori. Well, these are from our East Indian ancestors, who came here as indentured laborers. Tolom and Chilibibi, of course, are from our African ancestors. And while we're on the subject, when was the last time you saw some good pini? No, not the kind that's wrapped in tin foil. I'm talking about the real one here, you know, in fig leaves, what we call banana leaves. And how about poon, cassava or corn? And do any of you younger ones know about cassava bread? You know, when I reflect on some of these goodies, huh, I admire how self-sufficient our forefathers were. Apart from growing their own food, they provided their own sweetmeats. And may have come up with some original ones too. Like farine, for instance, made from grated cassava. That could be stored for months on end. A kind of cornflakes, if you like. However, a quick word of warning. Before you buy any of these snacks, I suggest that you check to see whether the seller is observing safe food handling procedures. You know, and not holding the food item with the same hand as the money. Always make sure that the food is stored in a sealed container, or at least that it's properly covered. You know, so that dust and flies are kept away. Now, once you're sure that all the rules are being observed, go ahead and buy, and eat, and enjoy. Now, let's rejoin Stoke for a sneak preview of next week's program. Next week, we are off to Toko to see how this picturesque little hamlet is making out with the hard times. We'll also reminisce about the old times when sugar and cocoa were king as we gaze upon that venerable water wheel in Diego Martin. And you water sport enthusiasts will be thrilled with a relaxing new sport that's creating quite a stir. Learn all about kayaking. Until next week, I'm Talks and Hill. And free, just follow me, and you see you and me. It's so good to be foot loose and free. I wander around through country, seaside, and town. Come with me, come on, see what's done, what's still to be done. The world is my playground. I believe in truth, love and freedom, I visit all but stay with men for long.